Buck Nutters, welcome to the Morning Five on Friday, September 5th, 2014. I am Dave Biddle, and I'm joined by the People's Champ, Matt Baxendale. Bax, on Thursday in the Boarding House, we had an item from a very good source that Pat Elfline has moved to center, hasn't just moved to center, will be the Buckeye starting center. And we have not confirmed this through Ohio State yet. It uh, wouldn't be the most shocking thing in the world to see Jacoby Bourne still start the game tomorrow against Virginia Tech. But we have a source that is adamant that Pat Elfline is going to be the starting center. Billy Price and Joel Hale will be the starting guards. And as usual, Taylor Decker and Daryl Baldwin will be the, the tackle. So this is pretty big. They've been saying that Jacoby Bourne's not big enough inside. <clears throat> Pat Elfline's definitely big enough. He's over 300 pounds, wrestling background. We saw him play well as a guard in the Michigan game last year. He's played pretty well. Last week at guard, uh, I like this move. If it's if it actually happens, I like this. Your thoughts on Pat Elfline moving to center? Yeah, I find it fascinating that they're moving Pat Elfline to center after the first game. Uh, it almost seems like a knee-jerk reaction to some of the struggles we may have seen on the offensive line in the first half against Navy. Uh, I remember going to practice and Elfline didn't take a single snap at center. But on the other hand, it's that confident that Joel Hale and Billy Price can get the job done at guard, and they think Elfline's by far the best option at center. Then so be it. Uh, and if it's also true, what does that say about how disappointing our buddy Chad Lindsley has been this year? Lindsley, Lindsley, not Lindsley. Corey Lindsley's for the Packers now. We can talk about him in a minute, though. But how disappointing has Chad Lindsley been now that he's uh, come to OSU and he's essentially the third-string center if the self line story is true? I mean, it essentially was a waste of time getting the kid, if that's the case. And now if people for- remember back when Pal- Elfline was being recruited, he was actually being recruited as a center and or guard. So it's not a surprise he eventually ended up there. It's a surprise that after week one and after all of fall camp where Pat Elfland, we didn't hear anything about him playing center for almost the entire camp. Now all of a sudden he's a starting center. I'm going to have to see it to believe it because it just seems like they're essentially turning themselves on a dime and saying, nope, now for something completely different. Yeah, our source was at practice and said he saw Elfline taking all the snaps with the first team. That could have just been them working him in there. So we'll see what happens. Our source says look for – doesn't say look for it. says Chad El- he says Pat Elfline definitely will be starting at center, but uh, we'll see. It uh, hasn't been confirmed yet, uh, but it looks like Pat Elfline will be the starting center. And I'm glad you brought up Chad Lindsay because that is a head-scratcher. I thought for sure when he transferred from Alabama, he was given some type of assurance from the coaching staff that you will be a starter because why would you leave Alabama to be a backup somewhere else? Furthermore, he had all of his other suitors, uh, like Michigan, that school up north, I should call them while I have you on the line, uh, and many others, they had starting spots open, and those are the schools that he was considering that he picked Ohio State over. So that is a head-scratcher. He's got to be rethinking his decision at this point, don't you think, Bax? Oh, I mean, I think part of the deal was is he probably was told, yeah, you're going to start if you show up in shape and if you show up ready to play. And what do we hear all, all camp about him? Hey, he's rusty. He hasn't played since the spring. Eh. He hasn't played in a while. Hey, he's not really in football shape. Maybe the kid didn't take care of himself over the summer, and if you don't hold up one end of the bargain, then the other end of the bargain collapses. So in terms of what we're seeing from Lindsay, which is nothing, I have to think it's on him as much as anybody else because it showed that the staff wasn't confident and born in the first place that they brought him in. This is a guy who started six games last year for Alabama, so I don't believe it's a, a talent thing. I, I do believe, like you did, that he was going to be told that he could start somewhere. But when he's not doing his end of the physical bargain, then the guy is just not going to be able to get it done. Plain and simple. If he showed up not in shape, he can't play. We're a day away from Ohio State's big game against Virginia Tech. Uh, Buckeyes are favored by 11 in this game. Um, Now, obviously, defensive coordinator Bud Foster is going to do the same thing that Navy's defense did. They're going to stack the line of scrimmage. They're going to dare Ohio State to throw. But Virginia Tech's going to be doing it with better athletes than what Navy did. Bax, I hope the Buckeyes come out with a more aggressive game plan. I understand there's a fine line there. You can't come out and have JT Barrett throwing it all over the lot, but I think JT Barrett's good enough where play action, he can do some things to hurt Virginia Tech if they say, listen, we're going to stack 11 guys, we're going to dare you to throw, which is what I'm sure they're going to do. Um, Talk about this game a little bit. Are you concerned about it? What do you think of the 11-point spread? Just uh, give us your thoughts on the big game tomorrow. Well, first and foremost, in the bucket last Sunday, I predicted 27-13 to for the Buckeyes. So I think they're going to cover, but barely. I think that 11 number is a pretty reasonable number. Uh, here's the thing. Virginia Tech is a significantly better defense than what Ohio State saw last week against Navy. Let's be very honest there. Bud Foster never has bad defense. He's been doing it for 15 years now. But on the flip side, Virginia Tech's offense has been flat-out terrible the last couple of years. And even last week, they debuted their new high-tempo passing offense with 
Texas Tech transfer Michael Brewer running the system, they still only scored 34 points against an FCS team, which really doesn't impress me that much. So I think what we're going to see here is a, one of those more dirty, gritty games that stays close for a little while. But in the end, as long, and I do think the offensive line shuffle that we're hearing about is probably a direct result of Virginia Tech having a very solid D-line. In the end, though, this is the type of game to me where I think Virginia Tech just doesn't have the weapons on offense to put up enough points. And we're going to really see what this new pass defense looks like in this game because they're going to try to throw the ball. They're going to try to go up tempo. They're going to try to find multiple receivers. And for the Buckeyes, this is going to be the litmus test of is this season going to be a sort of down rebuilding kind of year at Braxton out, or is it going to be the kind of year where we say, hey, J.T. Barrett really is as calm and collected as he seemed to be against Navy. Hey, our pass defense has finally been fi- fixed. Thank you, Chris Ash. This is going to be the game that's going to tell us whether or not the rest of the season is going to really hold the promise that we hope it still does, plain and simple. And I think the Bucks come out and they win by two touchdowns because, of, well, I believe that this defense is a heck of a lot better this year. We can't pick the same score. I was going to go 27-13. I'll knock a point off. I'll say it's 26-13. So I like the Buckeyes barely to cover as well. So I'll go 26-13. I don't know how they're going to get to 26, but maybe maybe there'll be a safety in there or something. I do look for the Buckeyes to score either a defensive touchdown or a special teams touchdown. Um, now, I know the Hokies are good on special teams, so maybe it'll be a defensive touchdown. But I'm going with 26-13 Buckeyes. And it's a huge recruiting weekend, of course. Um, it's, uh, many top players will be in attendance for this game. I want to get your thoughts specifically on Damian Harris. I've been I've been saying for a while that, okay, don't rule Kentucky out here because there's always, you know, they can tug at your heartstrings, even though we make fun of Kentucky football. But there's the chance of immediate playing time for Damian Harris down there because I know the Wildcats don't have anybody as good as Curtis Samuel. That's a freshman that's a running back. They don't have anybody as good as Ezekiel Elliott on that team. So, you know, there's a chance for him to play right away. And then Mike Farrell from Rivals came out and said that he's now predicting that Damian Harris will sign with Kentucky. And that's being taken to another level. It's not just like, hey, there's a, there's a chance here. You have people that are actually predicting that are, you know, pretty well respected in the business that are res- predicting Damian Harris is going to go to Kentucky. What are your thoughts here, Bax? Are you, are you still confident he's going to be a Buckeye, or do you, do you now think he's going to be a Wildcat? Yeah, here's the thing with Kentucky. They've made a lot of noise in recruiting the last couple of years, but it's kind of like hearing last year that Eric Smith and Marshawn Lattimore were going to end up going to Kentucky. I just I'd have to see it to believe it, plain and simple. Uh, Damian Harris has been a big Buckeye lane since day one, and I know he's from the home state school, and I know that they surprised everybody by keeping Matt Elam over OSU and Alabama and Florida and a host of other guys last year. And Matt Elam was the five-star defensive tackle from the state of Kentucky. I still have to thank with Harris being as close as he is with the commitments to the Buckeyes. OSU has been a long-standing leader. He's coming this weekend, his biggest recruiting weekend of the year, night game with Ron James in the house, tons of five-star kids. Maybe he's getting some pressure back home, but in the end, it's kind of like how we always heard Illinois was in on top kids. And they didn't land most of them. And when they landed top kids, they were from places that didn't have anywhere local to pull them. Like, they could pull to really spend them from D.C. Well, Kentucky can keep some of these kids at home. They're going to be better. They can poach Ohio for players. They're going to keep getting better. But in the end, there's a big difference between playing football at Kentucky and basketball at Kentucky. Right? Kentucky is not a powerhouse football program. I hate to break it to them. They never will be. They were a losing team last year, and the reality is they're probably going to be a losing team this year. And whenever Ohio State goes out and wins 10 and 11 games this year, whenever Kentucky goes out and loses a bunch again, and Urban Meyer has more time to sell his, sell young Mr. Harris on the benefits of playing at a real football school, not to mention all the pre-existing relationships and the head start Ohio State had in this recruitment, I have to think Harris still ends up a Buckeye. There's a lot of noise going on right now, but this is recruiting. There's always a lot of noise going on. And remember... These these kids, sometimes, they love the drama, and I wouldn't be surprised one bit here if there wasn't a little bit of drama being mixed into the equation. Remember, this is a kid who already once committed to an out-of-state school and has offers from everyone in the country. It's not like it's OSU and Kentucky for a three-star kid from Kentucky who has Kentucky family heritage playing at Kentucky. So <laughs> I still feel good about the Buckeyes. It's Kentucky, for heaven's sake. I'm with you on this, Bax. I mean, in proximity to home, I mean, obviously he'd be closer to home if he played for Kentucky, but if he played for Ohio State, his family could still see him play. I mean, that's one good thing. Ohio three State hours one favor way. That, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yes, it, it, you know, it's, it'd still be better for his family, you know, as far as a travel distance if he went to Lexington, but it's not like they have to catch a plane to see him play in Columbus. As you said, three-hour drive. And as you mentioned, Ohio State did a great job of – 
of building this relationship early. So I do think you know it's a close call at this point, closer than I thought it would be, but I do think Damian Harris will be a Buckeye in the end. Great stuff out of the People's Champ. I want to give a shout-out to Corey Lindsley. Uh, he looked great last night, in my opinion. Um, hey, there's all the stuff that, oh, we were, we're praying for Corey Lindsley. You know, it's going to be a long night for him while the Seahawks were talking some smack. But uh, now the Packers lost 36-16, to but Corey Lindsley, rarely do I watch a football game and focus on the center, but I thought he played really well. You also have Jack Muhor, who's going to start for the Colts. Uh, Andrew Norwell made the Panthers active roster. As we said last year, that was a pretty damn good offensive line, um, <laughs> and they're trying to rebuild it this year as we speak. Great stuff out of the People's Champ, Matt Baxendale. Thank you to all the listeners out there. Take it away, best damn band in the land. Bye.